Good afternoon and welcome once again to Concordia Theological Seminary. I am uh, John Nordling, uh, Dr. Nordling, and I will be have the privilege of, uh, of leading you pastors with the text for Epiphany 4b. And the gospel lesson is Mark 1, 21 to 28. Let us begin with a prayer. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, um, I underlined a couple phrases here that may be suggestive of the text, which is going to be the man with an unclean spirit and Jesus' healing of him. Um, first of all, that we live in the midst of so many dangers, okay? Um, one of which is just our mental health and our spiritual health. Um, we're in danger that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. In, you're going to see how in this text, um, the unclean spirit knocks this poor fellow to the ground, and he's literally groveling uh, on the ground and probably foaming at the mouth as Jesus throws this spirit out of him. So we need to be careful, too. We go through th so many dangers, and we are frail. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers, so more of the same and carry us through all temptations, the things that, that Satan uses to tempt us away from Christ and his kingdom. Um, just as we pray, uh, lead us not into temptation. Uh, and we pray this, and we're to keep praying it as long as we're in this body. Okay, <clears throat> so some things there. Let's now turn to the text itself. And uh, this is from Mark 1. It's right after the last one about the calling of the four um, uh, disciples. Um, and that's kind of reflected here in the very first verb, kai ace por yuontai. It's a plural there. So that would have included Jesus and Simon and Andrew and James and John. They're the ones that then enter into Capernaum. Capernaum, as it says in the Greek. Now, I've been to Capernaum, and it left an impression. One of the things you see right there is the ancient synagogue, and this must be the place where this very miracle took place. I remember that. It was so, so amazing. And then not far away, and now these are all just rubble stones today. Well, not the, not the synagogue. The synagogue is remarkably well-preserved. But then um, a stone's throw away is the house of uh, Peter's mother, and uh, uh, who uh, Peter's mother-in-law, I mean, um, out of uh, whom Jesus also is going to heal later in Mark chapter 1. So these are real places, and they're still remembered as such by uh, the Catholic Church, which has erected um, a shrine, kind of, a shrine over the very place where the healing of Peter's mother-in-law may have taken place. There's a church there with a plexiglass floor, and you can look right down. It's at, right at the base of the altar, and you can look right down below to where this happened. But that's later. I think that's going to be coming up later in Epiphany. Um, so they enter into Capernaum, and immediately, there's that euthus again. Okay, I probably could have circled all of them, but it occurs several times here. and I don't have time to mark them all down. Immediately uh, on the Sabbath, having entered into the synagogue, he began to teach. Okay, Ed did desk. And, okay, a number of things. First of all, you have tois sabas in there. Why is it in the plural? I wondered. I didn't know. So I did some looking and found out that it occurs about five or six times this way uh, in the Gospels. And all the, uh, 
uh, BDAG said about it was the plural used for the singular. So there you are. <laughs> There's not much more to say than that. I, it, it, you can't really make it say on the Sabbaths because this is a one-time event. So it's just an idiomatic thing. Having entered into the synagogue, um, so once again, I like to do this. Uh, you've got, I, I, the, the more I can teach you about Greek, the better. See the ace, elphone, ace. Oh, this dumb thing. Okay, see that? See that structure? Ace, elphone, ace, tain synagogine. Having entered into the synagogue, all right? It's a common, common pattern that you see in Greek all of the time. It doesn't go away. You can bank on it. So uh, that's what's going on there. Into the synagogue. So this is a prominent place. Into the synagogue. Notice it's got the definite article. And then down here in verse 23, in the synagogue, ente synagogue, auton, into their synagogue. So it's a well-known place. Still today it is. So, um, uh, there, there you have it. Uh, and he began to teach. Now, I did a little bit of work on uh, this word didasco, and uh, uh, it occurs quite prominently here in this section uh, at his teaching, for he was teaching, okay? You got to kind of use there, or a, a cognate used three times. Um, didasco occurs 17 times in Mark's Gospel and about the same amount of times in Matthew, usually of Jesus' teaching. For example, look at 213, 4142-6266, 634-831, etc. So 14 times. It's a prominent uh, picture of Jesus' activity, teaching, and then we're going to see a healing. Teaching and healing is going on here. Something I neglected to say was that the first two verses, 21 and 22, kind of provide the setting that it's in Capernaum, it's in the synagogue there, etc. And then the, 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 the healing occurs in 23 to 26, kind of the middle block. And then in 27 to 28, you have the, the reaction to this to this miracle, and it might help you just to kind of have a sense of, of how that's uh, working there. Um, all right, uh, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not like the scribes. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, a, an observation that is made by Mark the evangelist about Jesus' teaching and that it's not like the scribes and the Pharisees who, as you're going to see in this gospel, are often in direct conflict with Jesus and indeed lead to his demise, to his death uh, on the cross. Um, uh, so uh, then we, we go to the actual healing itself in verse 23, and immediately uh, <clears throat> there was in their synagogue... Okay, in that place that I've been talking about, uh, there was a man, an anthropos, a bloke, a fellow. Okay, uh, this is generic way of speaking of every man. Okay, in uh, in a unclean spirit, and he shouted out on a kraxen aorist. Uh, saying. So, on a croxon. Um, this is probably what would be called um, uh, an inceptive aorist. That is, at a sharp point of time, he began to shout out and scream, okay, and kept doing so. We might think that we need to have the imperfect there, but the aorist, the inceptive aorist, will do that nicely. Saying, legon, present active participle, Ti hemin kai soi, Jesu Nazariah. Okay, uh, what to us and to you, what, what is there for us and to you, O Jesus of Nazareth? Okay, so um, even though one, uh, one, uh, one, um, 
one, un, one spirit is speaking the unclean spirit. There are more of them. This is what that mean tells us. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then what I've done again, as I did in the last lesson, I've bolded Jesus' name, uh, O Jesus of Nazareth, Jesu Nazarene. Uh, uh, that's called evocative, okay? So, and then later he's going to be called the Holy One of God, Hahagios Tu Theu, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, at the very least, this man was disruptive, and the reason why he was disruptive, of course, is because he has an unclean spirit. He's not right spiritually, okay? He doesn't know the gospel, <clears throat> in other words. So what the Lord is going to do here is expel the wicked spirit. He's going to exercise him of this. And I think we can put this in terms of your people, too, as they hear the gospel. They are going to come to church sometimes, and they're going to be filled with an evil spirit, a wicked spirit. And think especially of those that are casual hearers of the word or, or have never heard the gospel at all. That's how they are. Um, they're, they're completely wrong and unclean spiritually. And so they act in a highly inappropriate way. They shriek and scream and they disrupt the service, the divine service. I know from having been in Israel that sometimes a mosque, a Muslim mosque, is right next to a very holy Christian site. And they have that call for prayer going out four times a day. And it is disruptive. You cannot not hear it. <laughs> okay? And so you have this same type of thing. And all of the things that are going up against the church and against Christians in contemporary America, same type of thing. Any way to squelch the gospel, the good news, the gospel that Jesus has been commissioned to preach through you, um, his pastor. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's see. What do I want to do? I know you who you are, verse 24. Uh, I know you who you are. The Holy One of God, this ha-hagias tu theu. Again, I had time to work on that a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, it's in Psalm 1610. Nor will you let your Holy One see destruction. That's a text that may have been known to Mark. Also in Isaiah 41, 14, uh, 16, and 20, you have the Holy One of Israel which may, was, would have been well known. In Luke 1.35, you have the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This is what uh, the angel Gabriel says to Mary at the Annunciation. And then a very pertinent passage, John 6.69, 6, where Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So once again, Peter's confession, which is spot on. So these are all places where you have this Holy One of God. And here in this uh, text, the unclean spirit confesses this and nobody else. So it's part of the secrecy motif that you have of Mark, uh, the, the disciples and the and the the synagogue worshipers um, uh, who have no need of Jesus don't confess them, but the, the, the one with the unclean spirit does know who he is and confesses him correctly as the Holy One of God. Okay, verse 25. Uh, let me uh, get rid of this. Okay. Um, and Jesus rebuked him, ha Jesus, once again saying, and then you have this, uh, this exorcism here um, in verse 25. Fimo theti kai ex alpha ex autu. So be muzzled, you wicked uh, spirit, and come thou out from him. That's what the Greek says. They're both imperatives. Fimo the, uh, fimao means to muzzle, okay, to gag. So be gagged. And come out of him, 
Shut up, is what Jesus says to this unclean spirit and come out uh, to him. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the very violent exorcism here. This is very difficult Greek, but just remember that the subject is ta noima. That's your subject. It's aorist. Uh, it's it's a neuter singular. So you should expect that the participles, sparoxon and uh, I, spar I thought there was another. Oh, yeah. Uh, phoneson are both aorist uh, participles, and they're third declension, right? So they're modifying tonoima. And having um, sparoxon, uh, having, oh, I forget what sparoxon means. Just look it up in the English. <laughs> the spirit and uh, the unclean spirit, and having called out with a loud voice, a phone megale, he came out of him. He came out. Uh, so there was a kind of a impact. Uh, there was a little bit of a wrestling. This, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't go here, but I, I can't uh, resist. It reminds me so much of Gandalf the White in the second Lord of the Rings movie where he throws uh, the evil sorcerer out of Theoden. Uh, remember that scene? It's great. It's a great scene, and that's exactly what happens here. And you, can, you know that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien took it right out of the Bible. I mean, that's where it came from, from maybe even this very passage. Okay, so that's, that's just a great thing. And then finally, after the, the exorcism, you have the, the, the reaction. Uh, Kai, uh, where am I here? Uh, can you scroll up a little bit, John? Kai ethalmathe san hapontes, and all, notice hapontes, not pontas, but hapontas, absolutely all of them marveled, with the result that they were arguing with each other. Uh, oops, I think you lost it. You had it there for a second, then it went down. There you go. So they, they were all uh, amazed with the result that they were arguing, sudzeteo. It's present. They kept on arguing with one another, saying, and then uh, uh, this is the, the faction that kind of is accepting Jesus. T. Esten Tuto, what is this? A new teaching according to authority. Okay, you have to have an exclamation mark here. Okay, it's an amazing thing, uh, and they've seen it happen. These are the, this is the part of the crowd that is Jesus affirming. Okay, that's what we have here, and that's the only part that we really hear. Uh, and then it says, he even, see this Kai? That's an intensive Kai. He even rebukes the unclean spirits. Remember, I said it was plural. Here's who came in up here, and you have the plural here. He even rebukes the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Amazing. We have seen it, and that's how it is. So once again, this crowd that has not really committed to Jesus here, they still have it right, and they still have established uh, what's going to be happening in uh, Mark's gospel, because this type of thing is going to be happening again and again, this, these exorcisms. This is a, a, a theme, uh, you could almost call it, of Mark's gospel, how Jesus is expelling spirits and uh, kicking the devil out of people so that they, go, they pass from death to life, okay? And as your people hear your sermon uh, preached uh, correctly according to the word, this will happen to them too. And then finally in verse 28, and news Ha, akoe, the news. See that definite article there? He, akoe, the news went forth. Uh, news of him, autu, I'd take that as an objective genitive, immediately everywhere. Euthus pontaku into all the surrounding region of Galilee. So, uh, and, and we're going to see now how Jesus does not like this, <laughs> this information going out about himself. And in Mark's gospel, you have the secrecy motif. 
Jesus rebukes those who got it right and tells them to be quiet. And it, it, it is kind of hidden uh, to the very end, as we know in, in Mark's gospel. So, it's again a glorious text. Let's see if I got everything here. I think I did. Um, it's Epiphany. And we have another place where uh, God in Christ Jesus is, is, uh, is manifesting his glory in the person and work of Jesus. And it starts um, small with him, with an individual exorcism. Then it becomes greater as this happens again and again throughout the gospel. And as it happens throughout church history, as the gospel goes out into lands it's never been. And now it is with you and your preaching and in your congregation and your congregation to the world. The very community, communities among which the Lord has set you and your people to be faithful. God bless you in this. Thank you.